Good day. Our presentation will be about the use of rice as gash as a supplementary cementitious material. But unlike many of the studies on concrete, we're looking at how it can be applied for use in interlocking stabilised soil blocks. I'm Alistair Marsh from the University of Leeds, and I'll be co-presenting uh, with my colleague uh, Marisha, who I'll be handing over to you now. All right, thank you so much, Alessa, for that introduction. Uh, like he's mentioned, my name is Marisha Nambatia. I'm very happy to be here. I am the country manager of Haleybury Youth Trust, and I've been working with Haleybury Youth Trust since 2015. Uh, HIT Uganda is located in Jinja, and uh, we are east of Kampala, about 80 kilometers. HIT is an award-winning charity that trains young people in climate-friendly construction and building schools and homes, as well as water tanks. While skilling some of Africa's most marginalized people, we use a compressed arc block that we call the interlocking stabilizer block. We use this to transform villages and refugee settlements. And in the process of skilling the young people, we improve their livelihoods and provide employment opportunities. So just a little bit more about how ISSB is produced. These compressed arc blocks are produced on site by mixing inorganic subsoil with sand and cement. The mix is put in a manual machine that you can see. And the block that comes out is a compressed block with an interlock and growth feature. The cement component in the interlocking block is only 7%. HYT is a big promoter of ISSBs, but why? Uganda in itself has gone very, very low on forest cover to less than 10%. Yet in the 1900s, nearly half of the whole country was covered in trees and forests. One of the contributing factors, and among the largest, is tree cutting for kiln firing. You can see from one of those pictures, very evident. We have a kiln in the background, and that is what happens conventionally across most of the construction sector. Whereas with ISSB, we don't do any firing. All we do is to cure these blocks, and after a period of 28 days, they are ready at their full compressive strength. I'll just go deeper into giving you some differences between ISSB and uh, fired bricks. You can see from the photo on the right hand side, ISSBs have that nice neat finish and can be left unplastered. Also, due to the interlocking feature, they are dry stuck for the wall area. And you see the difference because with our fired brick, almost 30 millimeters is used in the mortar bonding, which makes it costly for the overall construction. Now, whereas only 7% is, is the content of cement in the block, the cost overall cost to the block is actually contributed highly from the cement that is put there. You can see that 47% of the, of the cost of the block goes into cement. That's why we are looking uh, as, a, as the aim of our project to see that, can we be able to replace cement in this ISSB with rice husk ash. If we are, that will help us to use a waste stream of rice husks and improve the properties, the environmental properties of the ISSB, as well as its cost. Now we find this research worth doing because most of the research on rice husk ash has been used in concrete or has been done in concrete. Now nothing much in the arc blocks. Now this is going to pose practical challenges such as determining what the new mix design would look like. And also in this study, we are looking at 
local industrial sources of rice husk ash rather than the optimized lab produced ashes. Now, the suggested approach in this, uh, in this uh, study is one that is going to involve investigating the reactivity of the rice husk ash sources so that we can identify an ash source that is good for the blocks. And whereas we, we are doing this study, we felt that it needed to have both laboratory testing and field testing. Now in the field, we, we, not, we need to investigate what the water demand will look like in the mixed design now that we add rice as ash. And also what the impact will be on the strength and the durability. So we are going to also determine among the tests to do, we are looking at determining the water absorption as well as the compressive strength of the blocks once we replace with rice as ash. Now due to COVID, these experiments would have been done uh, in April, but we were unable to do that. And uh, we are only going to present some data from the pilot study, laboratory study that has been done by Alastair Marsh. Over to you, Alastair, to take us through that part. Thanks a lot, Marisha. Uh, so as mentioned, I will be presenting some of the characterization and reactivity results uh, from an ash sample that we've used from a pilot study. So uh, we've sourced this from a packaging factory uh, in Jinja in Uganda. And this was a 50-50 blend of the rice husk and the rice bran. And the factory had used this to fuel the boiler in their, in their factory. And you can see a, a small, an SEM image of some of those uh, ash particles on the right hand side. And so because it's um, an industrial ash, we don't actually know the precise temperature or time of combustion for this ash. It's also important to note that given that the blocks are produced on site, as Marisha explained, it's not feasible to use any additional fine grinding or, or sieving procedures. So we've analysed the ash in its as-received form. So firstly, looking at the physical characteristics of the ash, what can we learn? Well, it's fairly obvious that it's not optimised in terms of particle size. Look at the distribution curve and the photos in the, on the right-hand side. There's a fair few particles that are in the greater than one millimetre size fraction, as well as a, a large fine fraction as well. But because it's um, is not an optimized production process. It's therefore not surprising that firstly there's a wide range of particle sizes and secondly that the D50 is relatively large for an, a supplementary cementitious material. Secondly, uh, looking at the phase composition and the chemical composition, it's quite clear that it's not optimized in terms of the combustion process itself either. So firstly, looking at the uh, XRF oxide composition results, the loss, on the loss on ignition value is quite high, around 16%. So this indicates that there's unburnt carbon in there and therefore that the combustion process itself did not go to completion. Secondly, look at the XRD pattern. The presence of quartz and crystabalite suggests that the temperatures, uh, at least during some of the combustion process, were higher than optimal. So there was uh, transformation of the amorphous silica into these less reactive recrystallized phases. So both of these uh, observations are we know are not good in terms of uh, reactivity. But the question remains, is it reactive enough at least to use for this application? So to do this of course we use the R3 test, uh, in this case just the heat release method not the bound water content. And as most or if not all of us will be familiar with, uh, this measures reactivity in a simulated Portland cement environment. And because at this stage uh, we only had uh, one ash sample to use, we've compared its behaviour with other, other supplementary cementitious materials from the robustness test rounds. That is calcine clay and fly ash, two common SEMs, and a quartz control sample. So looking at those uh, heat flow curves, 
we can immediately see that the rice gash falls somewhere in the middle, much less reactive than calcined clay, but also more reactive than fly ash and reassuringly a lot more reactive than the quartz control sample. And we have similar observations if we look at the numerical values for the cumulative heat release at three and seven days. So what we can broadly conclude is that this particular rice as gash sample, uh, despite being not optimized or uh, processed um, after we've received it, has an intermediate level of reactivity. So uh, moving forward with this information, this particular ash that we sourced looks at least good enough to try uh, and use in those field trials and block production that Marisha previously mentioned. We'll also be looking to source other ash samples. Uh, the factory that we got it from has said they'll be willing to burn 100% uh, husk as well. And uh, once again, I apologize for not having as much experimental data as we would have hoped, uh, but due to COVID that wasn't possible. And we're hoping to start things uh, properly in early next year. So finally, I'd like to thank our funders, the Building Research Establishment Trust and the Worshipful Company of Constructors for this project. Uh, thank you for your kind attention and we'll gladly take any questions which you might have.